morning, everyone. We are here today with a distinguished panel to discuss something very relevant and important for the aerospace industry. War games enable decision makers to anticipate moves and counter moves and foresee their consequences. It is an old military concept being put to use in a newly emerging strategic decision-making scenario in defense and aerospace. And today we are in this chat room to discuss and understand the development of small aero engines in India. We have a very distinguished panel with us today and I shall be welcoming them one by one. Mr. Rajiv Chib, the co-founder of Insightian Consulting, a pioneer consulting firm in aerospace and defense, collaborating with experts to achieve the desired business impact. It is our pleasure and privilege to welcome Mr. Rajiv Chib in ADU's chat room and understand from him the roadmap to the development of small aero engines in India. Welcome, sir. We are also privileged to have retired Air Marshal Rajesh Kumar, PVSM, AVSM, VM. He's an alumnus of Mayo College Ajmer and an alumnus of NDA Karakwasla. He was commissioned in flying branch of Indian Air Force in June, 1982. He has held important assignments and has commanded both, commanded both an operational Indian Air Force command as well as a tri-service command. He has commanded a frontline fighter squadron and a frontline fighter base. He has also been the director of Air Force Project Monitoring Team. We are really privileged to have you in the panel, sir. Welcome. Next, we have with us Mr. Raghavendra Adla. Mr. Raghavendra Adla is a CEO of a startup called Paninian India Limited. Alumni of Purdue University, Indiana, and has come back to India to do something really breakthroughing, break through the whole aerospace industry, and they have achieved it. They had a breakthrough in aero engine design with digital twin, which is known as the turbofan engines. Welcome, Mr. Raghavin Vajla. And as we start with the discussion today, I will start, I will begin this discussion by asking Mr. Rajiv. So why are aero engines a strategic necessity or to ask you more specific, why did you choose this subject for a war game? Yeah, thank you, Chitali. Thank you for having me over here. Uh, yes, uh, we chose this subject because we thought that uh, indigenizing aero engines is now a strategic necessity, uh, especially with the changing nature of warfare. And we felt that there'll be a large demand now in future for UAVs, and missiles, whether they are land attack cruise missiles or low cost cruise missiles. Uh, secondly, we felt that to pursue our own foreign policy objectives, we shouldn't be engine dependent. And then lastly, there are now export restrictions under the MTCR as far as the UAVs are concerned and their engines are concerned, of course, after you know, those UAV which go beyond 300 kilometers. But since it is on the various export control lists, it's important for us to develop our own. So that was the reason we felt, because it is essential to India's national security, it is a strategic necessity. So we must have this as a subject of a war. So yeah, from here, I take the discussion and I take my next question to Air Marshal Rajesh Kumar. We are really, really privileged to have you, sir. Thank you so much for giving us your time. So, sir, I want to ask you, India will be spending more on its defense budget on UAVs and low-cost cruise missiles. Are we prepared for it from the air engine point of view? So, uh, uh... You know, uh, Chaitali, this is a uh, uh, this is the reason, uh, as uh, Rajiv said, that uh, it was necessary to war game this subject so that we could uh, understand clearly what our requirements were. Definitely, there is going to be more UAVs and more long range precision uh, weapons that are going to be uh, procured, and the nature of warfare we've seen in uh, the uh, Ukraine Russia war that large number of long-range missiles have been fired. And these have all been powered by uh, turbojets and, uh, you know, turbofan engines. So definitely there is a need to uh, indigenize 
to lower costs and to make sure that uh, uh, we uh, are independent in this. There's, uh, the Air Force definitely is going to spend more on this. In fact, uh, if you scanned the news recently, I think just a few days back, the Air Force has issued an RFP for a loitering munition, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, going to be more than 150 kilometers and is powered by an aero engine. So uh, uh, definitely uh, um, uh, the Air Force is looking at it and uh, this is the way forward and larger and larger numbers are going to happen. And now the other factor that has also come in is that earlier we were preparing ourselves for short limited wars. But uh, now uh, we've seen this war drag on for a long time and therefore uh, there will be a need to stockpile larger amounts of ammunition. So in future, the, the, uh, the amounts that will be bought will also increase. As well as once these munitions have developed, there are a lot of other countries which are looking and showing interest in these munitions and there is a lot of potential for export as well. Right, sir. On the same lines, um, I would uh, like to ask uh, Mr. Rajiv, this Ukraine crisis, the Ukraine-Russian crisis, has this actually accelerated all uh, all the research work or all the, um, the work we are doing for uh, to... Uh, start up with the more uh, the small uh, so small aero engines and uh, invest more on this uh, these kind of uh, work. Uh, yeah, it's a timing. A uh, lot of other nations, developing nations, you know, I can say South Korea, Turkey is another. They have already started the work for the smaller aero engines because of the reasons which I mentioned. They considered that it has started with necessity, and they started work before the Ukraine war also had started. It is just that the Ukraine war has also uh, brought out certain lessons uh, which are important for us and which are in the same direction. So we heard from, uh, from all the sectors and now we come to the industry. Mr. Raghavind, you represent the industry here. So I would like to ask you, the air engine development playing field is not level for qualified, globally certified private sector players. And as well as in-house academy. So is this true? And also, uh, if you can tell us something about the turbofan engines that has been developed by your organization. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, and uh, we are a relatively new entrant in the ecosystem. So uh, my full uh, sympathies with the challenges with other fellow uh, senior uh, industry leaders might have felt in, faced in the journey especially on the material front and the testing front. So we still see uh, it as an ecosystem play, uh, whether uh, Paninian has certain strengths. A company like Paninian has, does have certain strengths in building digital twins and have, we have an excellent design, uh, in-house design team. Uh, but having said that, we still rely on the ecosystem to succeed overall. So testing infrastructure, uh, test practices, and also uh, uh, getting the material access is a very key part of the success, which has an ecosystem limitation. So fortunately, the segment in which we are trying to uh, uh, develop engines, the small uh, turbofan engine category, as we call it. So we, where we are uh, developing a family of engines between ranging between three to 12 kilonewtons thrust. Now, fortunately, our understanding uh, based on a lot of expert review uh, inputs uh, suggests that it is entirely feasible to develop and uh, productionize uh, engines, turbofan engines up to 25 kilonewton within India. This is my understanding based on a lot of uh, expert inputs who have served the industry in, uh, in the past three decades. So if that is the case, uh, we would like to see that uh, in the as uh, as Dr. Mr. Rajiv and uh, uh, Air Marshal Rajesh Kumar sir has pointed out that the nature of warfare is shifting towards uh, the need to develop more agile and small systems in large numbers in less amount of time. So Paninian, a new generation technology company like Paninian, is trying to gear itself towards that possibility. So we, we want to be able to produce uh, 3D printed engines in a less number amount of time and uh, cater in large volumes. 
uh, ultimately we see that until the ecosystem challenges are resolved we will also be kind of uh, probably being limited in our ability to uh, uh, meet the full potential realize the full potential of the market right we have heard from all four of you a very overall discussion a, a very overall opinion about the small air engines i will concentrate i will narrow it down now to kaveri engine specifically and rajiv ji from you i would like to know that it has kaveri has faced a lot of criticisms but you say that kaveri engines are future ready so please i would like to know why you say so yeah yeah chatali so uh, that was one of the findings in the war game uh that the kaveri is future ready and uh, and should be progressed towards its entire curve and this project should be lotted top priority now the reason was that people felt that any platform which requires which is which is of a weight from 3 ton to 8 ton platform will require a power pack of the caliber of a kaveri and uh, these 3 to 8 ton platforms can be unmanned fighter aircrafts of the future maybe from 2027 onwards to 2030 onwards but in case we are going in for such kind of an aircraft or even if we call it something like the rpsa uh the remotely piloted strike aircraft which we are going in for and we want it to be ready by 2030 2028 around that period then uh the kaveri engine with 46 kN thrust uh will be ideal for these kind of platforms and therefore we must uh keep going ahead with the kaveri and get it tested at the earliest uh at the flying test beds in various countries whatever we have been doing and must keep giving it the priority it deserves not only for this but whatever we still learn from the kaveri it will help us in case we ever choose to go in for the 110 kN engine whether indigenous or whether with a jv or whichever it is it will keep giving us important lessons so that is why we felt that the kaveri is ready for the future and uh, must be given priority right so next coming to the industry perspective again uh mr raghavendra what is the estimated market of smaller engines in your opinion well uh, i think it will keep evolving as of now as the doctrine it will be rapidly reshaped uh, looking up by observing lot of the global uh, oh, war stages uh, uh, as we witness uh, war conflict across the world uh, but uh, as of um, my current understanding uh, there should be an at least a requirement for uh, uh, maybe an estimated 2 to 3000 of such engines especially for uavs and uh, cruise missiles combined so some firm orders are placed uh, i i i don't think i am in a position to comment on that but uh, i'm thinking of, of upwards uh, 2000 uh, any between anywhere between 3000 engines on the small engine category especially to cater to the cruise missile and the uavs that's a great number that is a good number to start with so um, now we come to air marshal rajesh so what development route do you recommend we should be taking for the 110 kn engine now so the 110 kn engine is uh, something that is uh, very technology intensive and as well as uh, it is uh, very uh, uh, cost intensive so uh, if you look at uh, you know let's say even the life cycle of uh, the m88 engine which is in the you know 90 kN class and uh, uh, it took uh, snecma almost uh, 15 years to incorporate all the new technologies that were there in the m88 engine so therefore this 110 kN engine also will take time it is not going to uh, you know we must budget at least a decade for it you know e- even considering that with modern technology tools we can ramp up a lot of the processes so uh, but since it's going to be 
uh, technology and cost in intensive, it cannot be made by the private sector alone because the market for this 110 kilonewton engine is going to be, let's say, even if we look at 200 aircraft or 250 aircraft, will just be 500, 700 engines, which is not adequate to recover the cost uh, uh, from a privately funded uh, uh, organization. So uh, therefore, um, it will have to be government-led and uh, it will have to be in a kind of an SPV uh, wherein uh, the private sector or joint development from a foreign country will, uh, uh, you know, uh, help us accelerate this program so that meets the timelines of the AMCA uh, phase two. Right, sir. So, Raghavindraji, given a chance on how can the private sector contribute towards the development of aero engines? What are your opinions and how do you think the private sector is can be contributing to this? Uh, yes, so first of all, I believe that uh, the model uh, which we should approach to solve these problems across the board, you take the spectrum of engines from micro, small to and medium to large engines. We are a proponent of uh, competition at all levels. But having said that, I also believe like uh, 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 Rajesh has pointed out that it's an ecosystem play and private sector alone cannot win this uh, game. So we, we believe that there needs to be, uh, we need to rethink of the way private sector interacts with some of the nodal agencies like DRDO or uh, Aeronautical Research and Development Board or ADA. And uh, there can be a potential to create a two plus one competitive uh, space where even in the design phase, uh, you, you, can, uh, uh, you, you can support private sector to come up with competitive solutions, uh, design solutions or prototypes of which the winner can probably, uh, you know, uh, the winning design could uh, pro uh, probably be taken forward. Uh, that that is what we believe uh, should be the way forward. But also, it's increasingly visible that uh, MOD is supporting uh, the idea of a private sector even owning some of the labs, uh, where DRDO's laboratory research uh, funding can also be co-opted by the private sector. Uh, that that is also something which we welcome a lot. But having said that, there is no doubt that it it has to be a concerted effort. Uh, I do not think uh, private sector alone in, in their collective capacity can coordinate well enough to achieve such a complex project, especially like Rajesh Kumar sir has pointed out that the 110 kilonewton engine project has to be centrally coordinated, creating ample scope for uh, competition as well. Right. That's what I believe. Great. Rajesh I would like to put the same question to you. How do you think private sector can contribute towards the development of air engines? Okay. Uh, you will have a different perspective altogether from Raghavendraji. So I would like to know your opinion on this. Yeah. Uh, yes. So I think they should be brought in for the smaller engines. Now the smaller engines start from uh, platforms which are of two ton weight and below. Now what is of two ton weight? It is like, sir, let us say a high performance UAV or a high performance UCAV. Uh, from here onwards, we go down to cruise missiles, CATS warriors. There's a CATS program which is going on in HAL. So the CATS warriors part of it, which is again should be in the weight of one to two ton platforms. Then we have sub one ton platforms also like target drones, CATS hunter, the hunter part of the CATS program. Now, all these, I feel that there must be a simultaneous development by NAL or GTRE and also the private sector and academia in a two plus one model. Now, the two plus one model is that in case you're giving a development program to a DTSU or a DRDO lab, also allow two private sector entities with academia to play a role. So I think that is where they can start playing. And this has to be institutionalized in a certain manner so that they also have the confidence of going ahead. Coming to you, Rajesh, sir. 
uh, a new module module titled National Commission for Aero Engine Development has been suggested. Do you think we need an apex body to oversee engine development? Yes, uh, definitely there is uh, a need for uh, uh, a central body, you know, just like uh, we achieved uh, success in space, we had a space commission. Uh, now, whether we really, uh, you know, what name we call this body, that uh, we can see whether it's a commission or a board or whatever, but it has to be under the PMO uh, for it to be successful because um, the coordination between various ministries, the moment we get private sectors in, the moment we get all the scientific resources that we need to get in, some of them are under the Ministry of Defense, under DRDO, uh, some of them are under Ministry of Science and Technology, and uh, there are uh, issues regarding uh, material procurement, uh, which uh, are coordinated by, uh, say, the Commerce Ministry, uh, if it has to be imported, and so on and so forth. And then there is the issue of getting the private sector in, you know, the materials, the technology for the materials may be available in the country, but it has to be economically feasible. So uh, then some incentives may have to be given to domestic manufacturers to actually manufacture that material in low volumes, which is suitable for our needs because our numbers are to that extent. It's only once we start exporting that the numbers will go up and then, you know, the private sector will be able to stand on its own two feet. So therefore, to get all these coordinations and policy uh, issues in place, uh, it has to be at the highest level. Otherwise, there are too many pulls and pressures uh, between the various agencies and uh, we, ending up, uh, we end up cutting each other's feet. So uh, it's better that we have a central board, a commission or a board, uh, which works under the PMO and has, is empowered. And also, I think that it, it should not be too top heavy it should just have a three layer, uh, uh, you know, uh, structure uh, uh, with, uh, you know, a board and an empowered committee and then the project head and the project head should be held accountable. And if that happens, then of course, the, uh, I think that the pace of development and the synergy between the private sector as well as the government is going to increase. Right. Rajiv about this ethics board, what do you think should be the roadmap? How uh, the academia, the private industry, the private sector, and the government body should work together in this apex body to uh, make it more successful, to make this project successful. Yeah, uh, yeah, Chatali, I think uh, all the analysts had recommended what uh, Air Marshal Rajesh has brought up. And they had recommended that the design and development as also the production should come under one head at the top level so that there is a seamless development program. And uh, this, this NCAD, which was recommended, it should be an executing institution, like you know we had the ADA, like the ADA, with enough powers to direct, guide, and control all the project teams of all the engines, which is going to be huge. And uh, preferably, of course, with uh, access to PMO, and uh, so that they can function as an independent autonomous body uh, mandated with the, all the broad functions of a development of all the aero engines in the country. So, so that is why this was brought out as one of the findings. Uh, Mr. Raghavendra, I would like to know the same thing from you about NCAED, the industry perspective, a private sector perspective from your... Sure. So yes, in principle, uh, I fully agree with uh, Air Marshal Rajesh and Rajiv Chipri, but uh, it's important for us to understand that uh, certain structures have been in place with good intention over the last three decades. Probably it's worthwhile exploring that. Uh, my own observation, having uh, uh, the opportunity to do comparative study of uh, the Korean aerospace industry or the Singapore uh, industry, the way uh, in which uh, in independent or international standards agencies or center of excellence have been bought in. Uh, whatever commission or uh, is set up, it should have uh, it should have uh, 
uh, access to global best practices or standards, whether it is uh, ASTM Center of Excellence when it comes to materials or ACE 9100 when it comes to certifying the for the quality. So it's important for us to understand that unless we streamline our best practices with the global best practices, it's very hard for us to compete even as an Indian, in Indian uh, private sector. So something similar was done in the medical industry. I could say there are some parallels. Uh, but it's uh, it's extremely important that even our materials, whatever whether a private sector producer player or a public sector producer uh, player produces such a material, it's fully compliant with the global standards and it's certified as as is, so that uh, if uh, any ecosystem player in the in un, under that umbrella of National Commission for Aero Engine Development can become a relevant player locally or globally. That, that's that, that's how I see it. So same opportunity. But yes, fully agree to the fact that it has to be centrally coordinated uh, project management effort. Great. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Well, it has been a wonderful afternoon. And I really thank Rajiv Ji, Air Marshal Rajesh Kumar, Raghavendra Ji, and Dr. Vikas. As we say, great minds when they talk and discuss, many new things come up and great things come up. I'm sure uh, this roadmap to the small aero engines is going to take, it's going to fly high. And uh, whatever we discussed uh, today is really uh, important for the industry, for the government to know that how we can develop this further. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time. And we really look forward to further discussions like this, which will give us more food for thought. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chatali. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.